everyone. Uh, this is Mike Lewis. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Sales at Awareness Bank, and I'd really like to welcome everybody uh, who took some time out today to be on the line with us to hear from Larry Weber, who's the chairman of the uh, W2 Group. For those of you that don't know who Larry Weber is, uh, he's, he's a guy who doesn't sleep. He's done a lot, and he's got a lot going on right now. Uh, of course, he was the founder of the Weber Group, which is one of the largest uh, tech PR firms in the world. Um, you know, you've all probably heard of Weber Shanwick. I uh, helped introduce, he's really always been involved in Interactive, actually helped introduce uh, HTML uh, to the world. Um, started the largest interactive ad agency, which was Thunder House, which is, of course, uh, sold as well. He's, he's, a, he's an author. He's actually published two books, has another one on the way. The first one, uh, The Provocateur, was published in 2002. And the one that we're going to be kind of talking a little bit about today that's going to touch on some of Larry's presentation is Marketing to the Social Web. Uh, which came out in a second edition just recently um, because it had been published, you know, because it had sold so many copies and was really successful. And I, I highly recommend it. If you haven't had the opportunity to read it yet, I read the first edition, just finished reading the new stuff in the second edition, and it's an absolute must-read for anyone who's trying to do, uh, trying to learn more about how to market uh, using social media. It's really a really cool book. I can't recommend it enough. Another really cool thing is um, Larry is responsible for one of the largest uh, Internet advocacy groups. For those of you that know MyTex, which is another great group to uh, you know be a part of, uh, that's all Larry's doing as well. And like I said, he's he's in the process of publishing his next book, Sticks and Stones, which is due out in July. So we're really thrilled to have him on the line. Like I said, he's got a lot going on. So uh, Larry, we really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah great to be here, and um, I can't wait to get started. So all right, hi everybody, and sorry we had that little uh, with that. Do you want me to jump in, Mike? Well, first, you know, if I could just give some uh, some background. Right now, we're uh, have a little agenda here. What is the social web? The marketer's new job. Seven steps to building digital customer communities. That is all coming pretty much out of uh, marketing to the social web. So let me tell you a couple things about some context first. I think, first of all, from the internet context point of view. I don't believe we're in Web 2.0, and I know that might sound very trendy, but I believe we're moving into Web 4.0. So here's the context. From when we introduced HTML to, uh, here we go, to 1993, that was, till about 95, midway 95, that was Web 1.0. And that was literally when I had companies like IBM say to us, take this stack of collateral material and put it on the web. So we were not using any of what the web was about. It was basically just becoming another publishing platform. When Web 2.0 really started, in my belief, was when the browser was invented. That's the first time Madison Avenue hijacked to the web. And what occurred then was, of course, we were allowed to click through things that were pop-ups, et cetera. And the first generation of real web-only companies were born, right? eBay, Google, uh, Amazon, et cetera. And that was really because of the browser and the ability to move and click and transact, all right? Web 3, I believe, is the social web, and that, of course, had its real roots in Friendster and Tickle back in the late 90s, but really took off, obviously, with Facebook, MySpace, et cetera, LinkedIn, as we all know now. Amazing that in a few short years, uh, Facebook, I think, announced the other day that there are over 200 million in uh, in members, which is just phenomenal, and also YouTube, which I believe in my next book, I have a chapter called The YouTube Juggernaut. I believe YouTube is going to have huge impact, far more than it's having right now, on the way we communicate and market. And uh, that, of course, became the second most popular search engine, uh, moved ahead of Microsoft MSN last uh, November. And Web 4.0 is where we're beginning right now. We'll go back and focus on the social web. But Web 4.0 is really what I call the emotive web, and that's where we're headed as we speak. And that doesn't mean – it means just simply what it is. It's laughing, crying, selling, buying, and it's going to be a more emotive experience because it's going to be so highly visual. And that's going to really change the way we live, work, communicate. And this is not a channel any longer. Any marketer or any chief executive that thinks the Internet is just a channel to communicate is really smoking something, all right? They have got to have a complete digital strategy just like they have a, a, a complete real-life strategy. Now, uh, as you know, we're having the largest media 
change in the world that were going on. I'm going to be talking a bit about it. Uh, but I wanted to tell you one story that I think is very cute of how media is changing. I have a friend in private equity uh, out on in San Francisco who is a very, very busy man, but he was also one of these guys that would send a mass email whenever his one son, Josh, accomplished anything. So we would get a mass email when Josh could ride a bike or throw a fastball or, you know, whatever. To, to bond with Josh, keep this in the back of your mind, everybody, he would take him fishing in northern Idaho, fly fishing, for a week every year. So just about six years ago, we get a mass email from my friend, and he says, guess what, Josh got into a great college. He's going to Berkeley. So we all sent our congratulations on how great Berkeley is, and congratulations, Josh. Two years later, we get a depressed email. Guess what, Josh is majoring in film. So we all said, hey, that's okay. you got to let a kid do what they want to do and follow their bliss, all that. So he, Josh graduates with honors in film, and his dad says, guess what? I got you an internship at Hamburg and Quist, a famous investment bank in San Francisco. And Josh said, Dad, I don't want to go work at an investment bank. That's why I took film. You know, I want to go do something else, and I have an idea. And his dad said, tell you what, you take the summer off and do your thing, and I'll see if I can keep the internship. So what are you going to do, Josh? He says, I'm going fishing in northern Idaho. He goes up to northern Idaho for 90 days. His dad comes up and says, okay, guess what, I was able to keep you know, the um, the internship for you. So what have you been doing? Well, Dad, I'm real excited. I've been going around different lakes and rivers, and I've been filming people that fish and asking them their secrets and where they buy their bait and what kind of equipment they buy and where they stay, where they rent their boats. Uh, it's, you know, how much they pay for their plane tickets. Where did they? And you know what? I'm up to 50,000 unique visitors. And you know what? L.L. Bean wants to underwrite part of the Chad area for two million bucks. So, lesson, there's about a thousand Joshes out there, if not more, that are focused on a whole new social way of creating media and content. And it's going to change the face of everything marketers especially do. On the um, next slide, um, you all should have the slide landscape, what is the social web? I've already... Did, There we go. Online place, common interest. We all know this, so I'm just going to keep going on. And by the way, they're going to keep micro-segmenting. It's very important to know the future of the web, Facebook will fail. This is the best way to put it. Facebook will fail if it doesn't micro-segment very quickly so that there's smaller groups and very, very specific types of content. So example would be, uh, not just uh, podiatry, uh, a group of doctors that are talking podiatrists, but ones that specialize in the big toe. I know that sounds funny, but it's true. So the micro-segmentation is going to be critical to, uh, to the way social media evolves. Uh, these are just some of the, uh, you know, the uh, categories that are very, uh, very important, I believe. I believe podcasts are extremely important. I think they're going to move uh, to more video casts, but... Uh, any chief marketing officer that tells me we've tried podcasts and they really don't work did two things wrong. One, they made a very boring uh, podcast. Or two, they didn't go out and tell people and communicate in other communities about what they were doing and what they had and what kind of content they wanted to share. Video is extremely important. If you don't have people that understand how to uh, use rich media and, and visual communication, uh, in your marketing groups, departments, etc., then you will fail in the next three to five years. Collaboration key, conversation, everything's about dialogue. Brand today, the definition of brand is the dialogue you have with your constituency. The stronger that dialogue, the stronger the brand, the weaker the dialogue, the weaker the brand. Blogs, I want to focus on just a second. They're only going to get more important. They are following the trajectory of the newspaper industry here when it was healthy and in a much shorter period of time. So it is self-editing and being aggregated, much like bloggers' uh, success, recent success of aggregating women's blogs. You're going to see a continuation of, of the best blogs being listed. Uh, what are the best uh, top ten? Who are the most influential? There were 39 newspapers in uh, in New York City in uh, 1800 when Jefferson took office because 
there wasn't mass communication. So it's self-edited down to a couple newspapers, but that took hundreds of years. We actually are going to, I believe, have fewer blogs, not more, in the coming years, but we will have more impactful blogs uh, that are also highly visual. Key to the future of marketing is understanding the blog sphere. It's not about talking at customers, obviously, and prospects. It's about creating and engaging with communities. All right, we, the direct marketing industry went way too far in just trying to target you, 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 you. Let's talk about common behavior and let's have some conversations and engage these communities in these conversations. Some of the leveraging categories, you can, people say to me, how can you build brands with social media? Oh my God, can you build brands with social media? By being honest, open, direct, by supplying content that is compelling, and by having dialogues with your customers and potential customers about the issues they're having, what they like, what they don't like about your products, what they like, what they don't like about your competitors. Lead generation is going to come continually, you know, if you do this right. And don't focus on the buy, buy, buy up front, which is the old way of marketing. I hold that whether you like Amazon or not, Amazon is the perfect example of where the future of a commerce site has to go. You go in, you might watch some videos now of authors, if you're looking for books, that is. You might uh, post some reviews, you might uh, buy a few things. At the end of the day, you're being entertained, educated, you're sharing with the community, and then you're buying something. So commerce is less right in your face, and it's more like going into your favorite store and doing and doing some looking around. You don't know how much you're going to buy because you're in an environment and an experience. So one thing you should take from my friend Steve Jobs is that it's not about the technology, but it is about the technology, but it's about how that technology makes experience the best for you. So our social technologies that are only in their first iteration, all right, are only going to get better to where it's almost going to be like real life, like you're going into that favorite store. So think of that for business to business, for medicine and for health, for every category in your life, one of the fastest growing categories in social is spirituality. Well, that people are actually feeling good about going to church online. It might sound bizarre, but hey, I think it sounds totally normal. In a busy life, you need some quiet time, you want to share with the community about some, some spiritual things, that's cool, all right? And they're giving money for that. I mean, President Obama showed us how that can be done, all right? Um, R&D, obviously, one of the greatest R&Ds because you have a living, breathing, ongoing focus group that never ends in social media. Product and service launches, customer retention. You know, it's interesting that more and more when I go into companies, it's not just the marketing people that come to the meetings. It's now every department that touches a customer. So it can be customer care. It can be sales. It can be HR. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's terrific. Uh, partner and channel communications, you can set up specific communities. It doesn't have to be one big, giant circus. You can have small, gated communities. I get a lot of pushback, especially from younger people, when I say the future of the web, too, is about gated communities, things that you can't get in unless you're a special belonger to. I think that's going to happen more as we evolve. So the CIOs of healthcare companies want to know they're only talking with CIOs of other healthcare companies about software they're using and hardware they're using. Thought leadership, huge for the social media, you know, terrific. And internal communications, media relations, and obviously crisis management. Old marketing, the new rules of engagement, you know, you see some of the things I've been talking about, new marketing, brands as dialogue. Customers are in control. They'll determine brand value. Group customers by behavior. Enterprise and user-generated content, you have to have a combination of the two. So that means you just don't let anybody, you know, uh, generate content. Professionals also have to be in the mix. Your company has to be in the mix. Uh, virality based on content, not subservient chickens. Uh, user reviews, Amazon started it, but that can be used anywhere. You are now publishers, all right? That's what we are, and we need to have great content that continues on. Bottom-up strategy, information on demand, and invest for growth. It's all extremely measurable as well. Seven steps to building a digital community. 
first, observe the conversations. If you're just beginning in this, which I doubt you would come to this if you're just beginning, but, um, you know, you've got to know what the landscape is. It's amazing to me how many companies just say, oh, I've jumped in and tried social media. I did a podcast. Well, how stupid is that? I mean, you know, what you have to do is understand the landscape. Just like any time you're going to do something, know where places are. Know what people are talking about. I was at a major automotive company. You said, there's no way there's that many bloggers talking about it. And we showed them that there were over a million blog posts in China alone about their product. So get out there. Use tools like Technorati. I mean, these are cheap tools, okay? Uh, you know, use other loads of tools. And then do your own deep dives by using search so that you know exactly what's going on. So learn and observe the landscape. Then recruit some members. Get out there and get people knowing about you. The biggest thing about social media is it is not out of the broadcast era. All right? And that's the problem I have with interactive agencies right now, that first generation. They're still putting up banners. Well, that's still one-way communication. Yeah, you can click on it. You might get somewhere. But that's still, it starts with one-way communication. Why aren't we building dialogues and moving that way? This is the most important slide in my deck, if uh, people can see it. Evaluate online conduit strategies. Why it's the most important is I basically have tried to boil the ocean here to give you four categories that you can build plans around. The first, I've talked about blogs and news sites. You know, uh, the I won't tell you about the woman that runs one of the major newspapers in this country. Uh, just a year ago, we spoke together, and I said, how can you let, you know, Daily Candy really eat your lunch in your own town, you know, around, you know, entertainment and the arts and things to do? And she said, what's Daily Candy? Hello. All right. But, you know, those kinds of blogs and news sites, uh, you know, even though they have regrettable names like Boing Boing, uh, I think are very powerful and are going to only get more powerful. The reputation aggregators from the Technoratis to the Googles, I think, again, we've only seen the beginning of uh of Google and, and Yahoo's uh I mean Google and uh uh YouTube's uh dominance. Uh we're going to move into an era of social search that's going to be very important. Uh where much like TripAdvisor, which was really the pioneer in social search, where you will go and say, Hey, has anybody stayed at this hotel in Crete? And everybody goes, Yeah, it's the worst place I ever stayed or it's the best place I ever stayed. And it's on and on and on. Important to have strategies around that. E-communities continue to perfect themselves. They'll only get better uh, from wine to women's issues to men's issues to sports, you name it, to technical issues. And social networks, it's not just going to be, again, for what I would say is your social time like or your music time or your even business with LinkedIn. Uh, gather, Facebook, I think we're going to start to see, and we already are, social networks in soccer, in, in football, in uh, diabetes, in spirituality, in Episcopalian church. You know, it can go on and on, and I argue that your customers will belong to nine or ten of these communities without even calling them social networks in a few years. It's just, it will be natural. You just wake up. And you're a part of a professional network, of social networks, of sports networks, of health networks. It's just going to make complete sense to everyone. So this is really a critical slide for understanding more of a categorization of uh, social media. Uh, engage the communities in conversation. You know, you really have to get out there. You just can't build. One thing a couple big clients of ours have finally realized is you can't just put stuff up on the site and hope people come by and say how great it is. You have to go be vibrant participants in other places if you want them to come to your place. And, you know, it's just like in your own social world. Who's going to come to your house for a party if you don't go to other people's house for a party? So it's a give and take, and you have to have good strategies and good programming around getting out there like that. Just more the other side, the digital media relations, this is the future of PR where you're going to be Twittering and you're going to be, you know, working on different angles and different content uh, platforms to try to get a, a, a lot of conversation and buzz going around what your company does and what it's selling. Uh, you know, if you have another, if I have another CEO say, yeah, this is all great, Larry, I get it, but how the hell do you measure it? 
Well, everything is so measurable online, it's not even funny because we know where everybody goes. I think we can always have as much quantitative measurement as we need. Downloads, installs, membership, uh, sales, license agreements, site rankings, et cetera, et cetera. What I think we all need to work on is the qualitative side of measurement. Share of conversation. How important? Do we have more of a share of conversation than our competitor does? Brand perception. Are we per perceived the way we want to be perceived? All right. The most important word on the slide, engagement. I've been saying for 10 years, we've got to learn how to manage engagement. How long are you spending with us? Are you asking questions? Are you posting comments? Are you talking with other people online? All right. Um, that is an important measurement tool. The tone of the digital dialogue, what is the tone? And then, obviously, building the right relationships with the right groups. Promote your community to the world. Here's where some traditional media can come in. But you've got to really work with the blog sphere, the e-communities, the reputation aggregators. I know everybody probably has search optimization strategies. How many of you have an organic search strategy? You know, how do you get up in that, you know, in the free area? All right, so you've got to really start to promote where you are, who's on your site, where they're going and what they want. Improve the company's benefits. Friendster didn't get it till late, so everybody left, but now they're finally coming back. But you just can't create something and then it, then it comes, you know. And uh, you've got to understand right now that marketing is a verb. It is no longer a noun. It's funny when I finished this book, um, Audience and Mike, uh, the first edition, you know, it was around Christmas 2006, and I came into the kitchen and I told my wife, and she looked at me and she said, that's great, you finished the book, but you look sad. And I said, well, you know why? Because I determined that marketing was going to get harder before it gets easier. And the big reason is, is we're, disor we're organized wrong for the new marketing, social marketing and media. We still have pillars. We're still too focused on paid media, on trying to buy our way into the hearts of customers and not talk our way into the hearts of customers, all right, with them. And we're too focused on not trying to do anything new and to get tasks done. So the website is done. The brochure is done. Like I tell you, this digital work and new marketing is never done. It's a constant sort of refinement. What are people like? You be, we become sort of the directors of conversations and uh, direct those conversations to the benefit of our company and its products. Some companies, I think, that are starting to really get it. I love uh, some of the new Marriott stuff that they're doing, what Sony's doing. Uh, I like some of the work that Hershey's has done recently and um, the American Heart Association. I think is really starting to use some of the social tools that are available. So um, with a nonstop talk uh, like that, uh, I'd like to see if there's any interesting questions from uh, the hundreds of people that are, uh, that are listening and watching this. I went very quickly. The book delves much more deeply into this. I have a whole new chapter called Does Facebook Matter? And actually, the Facebook people were a little disturbed, but we've made up uh, lately. We kissed and made up, and so we're friends again. When I had said in the book, maybe it doesn't matter that much as a social network, but it sure is profoundly important as a communications metaphor or paradigm, because the communications paradigm of one to many, like they have made popular, that like Twitter is now making popular, I think is going to be the way it, it's almost becoming the email of the next generation, and also all generations as it catches on. So I'm not going to worry about how they monetize because that's their problem. But one thing they've already changed the world is that they've changed the way we communicate. And uh, and I think it's all for the good. So uh, we got about 24 minutes for questions, Mike. Did any of this make sense, you guys? <laughs> well, I can tell you, just reading the comments, this is Mike. Uh, I can tell you, just reading the comments from everybody. On our Twitter, I think it made sense to everybody, and I think um, you know a lot of people uh, got a lot out of it. There's still a, a ton of questions, but I'll give you a pretty funny quote, Larry. It's uh, Larry Weber screwing off so much intelligence right now with a big exclamation point. So I, I think people actually got a lot out of it. So um, that's good. I, one thing I didn't, you know, mention t too much deeply, but 
I'm a, and it's just because people like consu- think consumer all the time. I'm a big proponent, and most of my work, believe it or not, is in business to business social, and I think that's going to be huge, uh, and that's where it's going to be more gated, more micro segmented, more uh, almost a little more formal. You know, you look at some of the nice YouTube channels of Sony or, you know, of Apple. These are very organized. They're thoughtful. And there's some rock and roll, but it, it tends to be more jazz or classical in nature. And so I think there's a lot of uh, B&B work. But anyway, I just wanted to make sure I got that in. Well, before I jump into the right, I just want to let everybody know one thing real quick. That following the presentation, we're going to send an email, and I'm also going to tweet about it, and we'll put it up on our Facebook page as well. Uh, the slides will be available, so uh, I apologize we didn't address that at the beginning, but you don't need to ask. They'll definitely 100% be available for you to take a look at and download. Um, as, long as, as, long, as long as they buy a book, Mike, because all the royalties go to charity. So. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so definitely then more incentive to buy right. to buy books, right? So, yeah, download the, download the presentation and buy a book. Right. Um, that's the message. Well, one other question that keeps coming in that actually has, well, a little bit to do with the presentation, but... Uh, do you actually have a, a Twitter account? I do have a Twitter account that's not live right now because I was getting so inundated so much. We're going to go back up next week, all right, and it's just been too hard. So I'll take all the, you know, everybody can shoot the arrows at me right now. Uh, but I have a Facebook account with thousands of friends that I hardly get to post things on because I've been so busy writing and doing other things. So I apologize for all you religious people of Twitter and and Facebook because I if you friend me I usually friend anybody which is probably not a good idea but I do so again I apologize I do have a Twitter account that I am not using right now because I keep getting all these right now Joe Smith is once is following you on Twitter I've gotten at least a thousand of those in the last two weeks so and I'm not doing it so I apologize. All right no that's 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 fine what we'll do is when it becomes live I'll. Send, a, send another note out to everybody, just making sure that everybody follows you. Yeah, we'll make sure. I'll tell Farah, Farah, who helps me with all this, we'll let you know when we're live on Twitter again. But don't expect me to do it every day again. It's just it's it's just a little much. So I'm trying to figure out a good time. But that's a good question to ask you, Mike. What do you think a good, you know, sort of, you know, amount of time is to spend on Twitter? You know, I think not just for the sake of something. It's You should have something smart and good to say. Yeah, I, I kind of mix things up. I mean, I, I don't have a specific amount of tweets that I send out in a day or a week or a month or anything like that. I mean, yeah. if there's something that's relevant to me that I think, you know, that the you – know, I don't tell people that I'm waiting in line at Starbucks or, you know – Thank like God. Yeah. Stuff or stuff like that. I mean, I try to have stuff to say, but it's a mix. So, for me, it's about the Red Sox or Boston sports and, yeah. and uh, social media in general. So, if I see something that's cool, I'll forward it on and – I have something interesting to say. I'll say it. So, I mean, for well, me, it's that, four, five, that's the way to do it. I I was a little miffed the other day on Facebook when somebody I know who I like, but they said she had just emptied her dishwasher. I was like, "Hello, and why am I reading this?" You know, it's like but anyway. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's kind of, it kind of brings up an interesting question. It just came in uh, from someone on Twitter, it's, and and what she's asking is is something I've heard a lot of times before, just with the stuff we're doing at awareness, but. I'd be interested in getting your take on it, and that's how do companies, um, you know, get to engage in dialogue without feeling they have to control the message, or, you know, even better, without controlling the message and yeah. the right strategy to take. Yeah, I think the, the first answer I have uh, to those people is it's out of your control anyway. The conversations are happening more and more about your company and your products, and then the, to the doubting Thomases, we usually have to prove that and show them where the conversations are happening and how they are influencing opinion of purchase uh, uh, decisions, et cetera. So that's the first thing I would say. The second is that um, you can't control what you can't control. Um, you know, you can't control what your person is going to say when you're having a dialogue with them. So, you know, it's probably stupid to try to think you can control that. And third is you can if you're still a control freak after all that. You still can have a semblance of control of because you control the content that you create. If you control thoughtful, transparent, uh, creative, and good content that's used, read, viewed, you know, by your customers and potential customers to create more of a conversation, that'll be a sense of control. You also, like I say in the new book, 
can build through that content what I call social equity or social business equity. So that if something bad happens to one of your products or people, something doesn't like, you still have this whole bucket of goodwill that you've built by producing good, thoughtful, easy to uh, 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 consume content uh, on the site. So, yeah, I get the question all the time, but it's like, you know, we got to, you just got to let it go. You know, it's life. You know, do what you do best, company. I've always argued if you've, you know, made cars for 100 years, I guess it's not turning true to one of our companies or two of them, but you should be pretty good at that. So let's accept that and let's work about building a relationship. Put the customer at the center, not the car at the center. And, um, you know, that's, I think, just common sense. So, Everybody will have control issues. I mean, everybody's parents have control issues. So companies are going to have control issues, too. But I think we can get over it. And so do you see a lot of companies putting in place kind of uh, social media policies or guidelines? That yeah, the first thing we saw, and we helped a lot of companies like two, three years ago, was blog policies. So you have to work with the lawyers. And, you, you know, sometimes you have better lawyers who are more open than some of the other lawyers. But... I think, yeah, with blog policies, there's, and I think most of those policies are important. I think you need to have some order. Uh, you know, it just can't all be chaos and the Wild West, uh, but that doesn't mean that people, you can't just order people to do things, but you can have some policies. So I think, yeah, and you'll see some more policies. Uh, I think a lot of companies are having YouTube policies. Facebook policies. I mean, I think it's silly for companies to not let you go on Facebook during work. I think that's sort of stupid. Because, I agree with that. Yeah, it's just part of life. I mean, you know, God, come on. You know, I work hard. Why can't I shop on Amazon during Christmas time, you know, from work? I mean, for an hour, you know, at lunch or something like that. So I, I think that's silly, companies that do that. So I think companies should embrace social, should be thoughtful about it. And, you know, the, the cool thing is, is they'll actually, if they do it right and work hard at it, they'll spend less money than they did on marketing before. Sure. And um, I also think they really need to spend a lot of time around organizing. Just now, uh, well, I can say it, one of our clients, IBM, um, we're finally seeing titles, you know, like director of content, uh, director of social media, uh, you know, director of community, all right, so we're starting to see some addressing of titles and organization that I think is going to help in all of this. Absolutely, there's no question. And one of the big questions that kind of ties into all that stuff about what companies are doing and how they're really watching with social media and reducing costs around everything, what, what are you seeing in terms of ROI? Are there, and I know that's kind of the, you know, no pun intended, the $50 million question, right? The, right. The one that every, the holy grail that people are trying to find. But what, what are you seeing out there with the clients you're working with around how they're tracking in ROI number one? What, what metrics they should be look, what metrics companies should be looking at? Yeah. And success, you know, companies are having around that. Well, first, again, you know, and, and I know there's a lot of critics out there of this, but we're so beginning in this, in this category and, and, and this change in marketing. We don't have the 80 years of sophistication that broadcasters had to get, you know, CPMs, right? So are we going to be end up being a CPE, a cost per engagement? Maybe. But, you know, we need companies to start working on that kind of stuff, to work on the kind of stuff that the, uh, the NFOs and the Taylor Nelsons and the Nielsens and the, you know, uh, all those companies did back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s in the 70s that made television advertising so dominant, uh, not just because of the entertainment factor, but because they could say, you know, they could actually sort of produce those graphs and those reports. So I think we need to get to some common language. To that end, we started a group down in New York called the Social Media Advertising Council that SMAP that's going to be trying to work on these kinds of, um, you know, tools, platforms, not making them, but how, get it, bringing the family of companies that are doing that together so that we can try to come up with a common language, much like the ad industry did, and that let them dominate for so long. So we do need to do that. The next thing I'll say is I still believe that trying to bring in the CFO model of for every dollar I want to see how many dollars back I get is still a little off. We will get there, Okay. But the first job is to build the store. We don't know how many sales we're going to get if we don't build a cool store with good stuff in it. 
all right, and good communications and good a good feeling and a good experience. So you just can't do that overnight. So I argue that especially in business to business, all right, where that this is you know uh, large com- enterprises have a six to twelve month sales cycle, then you have time to create you know a site that potential customers want to come in, spend time, meet other potential customers, talk about topics that are relevant to them and their issues. And that ultimately, if you build that relationship strongly with them, that will result in a sale. Now, as far as like Skittles or the stupidity of the Burger King agency uh, the other day saying, if you unfriend 10 people, we'll give you a free Whopper, which I thought was uh, ludicrous, you know, um, just to get attention. I think that's just silliness. And, you know, and, and that you might have an ROI because they sold a million Whoppers. All right, so all right, maybe marketers say that's a cool thing and we'll, we'll use that. But I argue this shift is more generational. It's more renaissance in nature. And so you can't, how did you measure the renaissance? I mean, I'll go off. Uh, you know, on and on. We're still measuring the Renaissance, you know. So, you know, we're in the beginning, and we all have to work together toward those metrics and those ROIs. And, you know, there's more and more tool companies, you know, from the Radiant Sixes to the, you know, and I guess Symphony was around and, um, you know, these. And they were all first generational. And I, I know there's been another set of, of companies coming around, but we've got to get that common language. That was one thing I respect deeply out of Madison Avenue, that they all somehow colluded and got together and were able to put together, you know, a set of measurement metrics around the most popular thing in the world at that time, which was television. And right now it's obvious the most popular thing right now is being online and uh, being social, but also consuming entertainment, games, and other media online, and it all can be ultimately measured. So. Absolutely. So you mentioned one thing that a lot of people had questions about, both through the through through Twitter and through our, you know, the Q&A part of, of WebEx. So I'm going to try to summarize them all into one question, and that's how do you get started as a B2B company? In the, so the first part is how do you get started in B2B uh, you know, being in social media? That's, that's kind of number one. And then number two is, you know, you talk a lot about kind of the gated community or, you know, we yeah. call them velvet rope type communities. Yeah. Um, you know, around here, but if you're getting, is, is that where you see the web going in the future, and does that really apply more to the B2B side, or is that kind of broadly, you know, B2B and B2C? Uh, let me take the um, uh, first one, just getting started, I think take my slide on observe, I think that's where you get started. Don't try to do anything yet, just learn the landscape. Your category of business, you know, just Google it, go to Technorati, find out if what you do is your a middleman for wood, selling wood. You know, go online and find out who are the top bloggers about wood, you know, and the marketing of wood and the selling of wood products, and et cetera, et cetera. So just go and learn. It's not that hard. It doesn't cost a lot. Make a drink at night and go into your de- go onto your desk and start to Google around, technorati around, learn the landscape of what conversations are being had about your category, your competitors, in the unpaid world, not the paid world. So that's where I would start, and I I wouldn't go anywhere else. I would do that right now. Now, as far as gated or velvet rope, however you want to call it, closed, some people try to call it, I think they're already, well, obviously they've already come up in the, uh, people won't like this, but one of the biggest industries online is sex. And, you know, that's obviously a a, a velvet, you know, uh, rope or, or gated communities because they want to be sure they get paid for, for showing that kind of stuff. I, a good example is wine. There's a number of gated wine communities, and it's a very cool idea because they say we're only going to allow 50,000 people in here. And when we lose somebody, you can come in. But the reason we do that is so that we can make sure we have the business model straight so that when uh, 10,000 people say, we really like this Shiraz from Australia, we say, we're going to go right to the vineyard. So these two college kids from Stanford go right to the vineyard, buy 10,000 at half price, and ship them to all those people, you know. So you're going to see that kind of, you know, more and more that really devoted, I mean, so they'll be, say, maybe quasi-open, you know, so that you can get in, but it's almost more like a country club or a, 
a reading club or, you know, that kind of thing that's going to have to happen. Now, on the pure business-to-business side, you know, I, I think for sure uh, it's probably going to be better to go the gated route to the, as you call it, the velvet rope route because of the micro-segmentation. And you want to offer a, a unique experience for your customer. And one thing comp- companies could do then is you sort of, if you're trying to sell somebody, if you've developed a great community, give them a pass for a day. Why don't you go to our community for a day? You know, you check around, see what our customers are saying and what they're talking about, you know, and then it, there's a timer on it and it winds down. So it opens up a lot of possibilities. It can be really closed. It can be sort of closed. It can be, you know, you can use it as sort of a, a you know, a, a, a temptation uh, for sales and, uh so I, I definitely think it's going to go that way, and I can't overemphasize visual. It is going to explode in the next 36 months to the point where I see we'll see so little text on the web. Uh, we're going to be searching for text, you know. <laughs> interesting, yeah. That, well, it's funny. We just got – there's a really interesting tweet that just came in. It's from Peter Gorman, and he said, you know, here they are talking about wine, velvet, ropes, and sex. What are we talking about on this call? You know? <laughs> Sorry, see, that's how you came in a different context here. You know? Yeah, that's actually the follow-up webinar we're doing next week. So. Right, right, you'll get a lot more attendees than 500. You know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, another question that keeps coming up is around kind of the executive leadership of companies, the question of social media and the value of social media, and how to get executive buying around it. And I know you've worked with a lot of different companies, so... Yeah. Uh, any advice you could share? I think a lot of people are kind of struggling with, you know, how do we convince management that this is a good thing? They're saying it's not scalable. They don't think we're going to get an audience. You know, all those, you know, the standard topics that people are bringing up. Um, yeah. Advice yeah. You have? Well, you know, I do hear that a lot, but I think, you know, I don't hear it as much with the CEOs I meet in their early 40s or, you know, mid-40s that have sort of grown up with the web and, and games and, and stuff and understand how there's different communities. Uh, that can have a big impact. What we often have to do is do our own research and our dime and show them that, you know, uh, uh, I remember this CAD CAM company, it's quite large in the Boston area, didn't believe in any of this, and we showed them how there was over 3,000 engineers talking daily about their products, what they liked, what they didn't like, and they said, no, can we see that? And so we show them all this. So, you know, it's like, you it's almost, again, the whole Doubting Thomas syndrome. They have to go there and show them, you know, that there are conversations happening. That, you know, it was interesting to be out at General Motors a couple of years ago. And, you know, uh, they actually got it. They just didn't know what to do about it. But they were getting more, they were, they were having more issues with a blog, a, a woman that had a blog uh, in Nebraska about uh, car safety. And they were millions of hits, millions of hits about is my car safe, who's had a problem with this latch, blah, blah, blah. Well, you, we showed that, and it was like, oh, my God. You know, in fact, we had no idea these kinds of conversations were that deep. We knew she was out there. But, you know, and it only grows because, right, it's, you know, you tell your friend who bought that same car, and, you know, and it keeps going, 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 going. So if you show them examples and what it's done, you know, it's really important. Today, I get a call from a client. It's a client of our U.K. office and not here, but they make one of the top two backups. In other words, of um, uh, where you send off, I think it's a service like $5 or $10 a month, where they back up your computer so that if there's a hurricane or a storm, you don't have to worry about your photos or your files. or They do all that. Well, they're... Uh, that happened to be about a month ago, they had bought some bad servers from a company and they sued them. And for a time period, they had lost 7,500 customers, uh, you know, data. Now, they recovered 99.8% of all of it. They sued and won against this server. But what does the digital newspaper in this town put up? But a month later, you know, X company loses 7,500 people's data. And they didn't put what really happened. That then got onto TechCrunch. Then that went to blog. And then it's everywhere. It's like, you know, like a virus kind of thing. So we had to walk through what to do, et cetera, et cetera. But that's that's the the fear reason to get involved and really know the bloggers that are talking about you, talking about your category, you know, know where those conversations are. So if it doesn't work on the positive side, we can always use fear to tell the CEOs, you could lose the company. In a day, with one click, 
you know. <laughs> it's really interesting. Another question that just came in that, that actually goes back to the one that you answered before, but I think it's a relevant one. Uh, and it's from Aaron Bean. He asked, um, if every if everything is going to go visual on the web, what happens to SEO practices? Yeah, well, what you're going to do is you're going to have a lot of visual search, like uh, there's a company actually in Boston called Everything. Yeah. Um, there's other visual and um, oral, A-U-R-A-L uh, search. Uh, so you're going to see Google introducing a lot more of that. All right. But, but also remember what Google's doing, it, what uh, their search is in sentences. It's, I wouldn't call it, it is text, but it's not really paragraphs. What I'm talking about more about is the disappearance of sort of storytelling through writing, specific writing, and more storytelling through visual. So instead of an annual report written out online, you actually have the CEO saying, hey, welcome we are to X company's uh, annual report. We had a good year this year. Uh, if you want to go right to the numbers, click on CFO, and he'll or she'll walk you through that. And uh, if you want to see what we're doing in the marketing area, click on CMO, and he or she will walk you through some of the marketing stuff we're doing. So I see more of a talking, more of that. And on search, I still think you're going to have a long term of sort of that sound bite search or sound text search, if that makes sense, to uh, to uh, the, especially a search that's local. But you're already seeing a lot of uh, new icons in mobile search, and you're pressing on icons less than you're, you know, using words. Um, so, again, a balance. And I guess last thing, remember, I, you know, I, I say a lot of things just to get people's attention, too. And it's not, it's not like everything is going to be completely gone. Uh, it takes a long time. I had a, a French teacher who once said, we didn't all die in the Renaissance and wake up in the Baroque. You know, there's, there was about, you know, a hundred years in between, you know, that kind of thing. So it'll be shorter this time into the new media world, but, you know. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, another great question that we have is, uh, I, I've always heard that it's better to integrate into a community rather than create a new one. Yeah. Do you think that, do you, think, do you believe that's true or do you think that's just a myth? No, I think it's both. You have to do both. I think, yeah, I get a lot of guys who say to me, well, can't we just integrate in other people's? So what do we have to spend the money doing our own? And I think that's really, really small thinking because the brands of tomorrow are going to build that community that are experts on what they do, you know. Yep. And I think that's extremely important. And then it's extremely important for credibility to be out there and sharing on the other communities that talk about the category you're in, the thought leaders that are in that, and what you do. So I think it's both. It, it's like the slides. I forget what number of the slides were, but it was like number three or four, promoting your community so you've got to go be on other places, and you, and you can't be a pig about being on other places, like just posting things for attention. I think you have to be a thoughtful member of those other communities if you want to get the attention for them to come back and participate in yours. Very interesting. So another one, um, here's someone says says, <laughs> um, is, is frequently updating, how frequently, and we kind of talked about this before, but someone says to do is kind of the, the proverbial cobbler without shoes, uh, they don't have a website. Um, yeah. But is it smart without a website to frequently update Facebook or LinkedIn? It's a very tactical question, but I think it applies to, you know, how often you should be speaking and, and really should be getting a website. But um, is it a good substitute for a company that may not have a website? Uh, sure, it is. At least it's some digital expression of what you're doing. And uh, like you were saying, you know, I, I wouldn't – if you don't have something really to say, don't update it, you know. I don't want to hear that you're, you know. I mean, I used to make fun of these guys when cell phones first became popular. That's how old I am. I'm not telling the audience how old I am. But uh, I used to tell my wife, it was like the second the plane landed, these guys would, and it was mostly guys, so it shows we're the dumber race uh, or the group. But they we would open up their new mobile phones and they'd say, oh, hi. Honey, I just landed. I'm getting my coat and my briefcase. Now I'm walking down the aisle. Oh, now I'm out out <laughs> of the plane. Now I'm going to go try to get a taxi. And I'm like, Jesus, you know, what is going on here? So to the same thing, you know, if you're going to use Facebook, LinkedIn, or whatever, it's not it, – it's, it's like, why would you watch eight hours of television? I mean, it makes you a vegetable. 
So it's the same thing. Why would you do 24 hours of social media? Do it when you have something interesting to say, something thoughtful to bring about, and you could that's good, and people will start paying more attention to you. And then as far as your own site, I mean, you got to have your own site. But you remember, your own sites do not have to be complex. That's the other thing. The problem with having sites belong in IT, and that could be a whole other show, because IT should be our slave. They should be the slave to marketing people and the people that touch the customer. Technology should be our slave. So, you know, that's got to be, you know, you don't start creating these complex websites that are just a pain to replace and a pain to add to and do things. They should be user-friendly, nice interfaces. I'll leave you with one example. I was helping my oldest... Larry, you there? Well, everyone, I apologize. It looks like uh, the line got cut off towards the end. Um, uh, Larry dropped off. So I want to thank everybody for being on the call with us today. Unfortunately, we got cut off early just before uh, we got in a, or Probably was going to be a really good example from Larry. But I uh, just want to thank everybody for being on the line. We really appreciate taking a few minutes this afternoon to – uh, chat with Larry and I. We're going to have another webinar coming up on uh, April 29th. That's how to get the post um, from your agency around social media. It's going to be with Emily Riley from Forrester Research, and we hope you can make it. Um, you can register on you can register on our, our website. That's awarenessnetworks.com. And you know, again, thanks very much for your time. Appreciate it. Look forward to hearing. Look forward to speaking with you again.